Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's an unbelievable honor of mine to introduce you to the best boss I've ever had, the most wonderful uh, gentleman, an incredible uh, entrepreneur, very successful, and a very nice guy, Jim Patterson, Jimmy Patterson. How are you, sir? Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Brian. It's nice to hear from you this morning. My pleasure. So, Jimmy, I wonder if you could uh, just, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got started. Uh, um, you know, rumor is that you were uh, um, a used car salesman and, uh, and that's what got you started becoming a, a, a big, huge business builder, entrepreneur, um, conglomerate in the go-go era of the 1960s. Is that, is that accurate? Well, it is accurate. I actually started washing cars. Uh, the, I applied for a job. Um, as a used car salesman and Mr. Richmond, my, the boss, said, no, I have no job as a salesman, but I have a job washing cars. And if you want to wash cars and we have one salesman and if he's busy, I'll let you speak to a customer. But if, as long as the salesman is there, your job is to wash cars. So that's how I started. Washing cars, but then uh, you must have got it got started selling cars sh shortly thereafter, and then and then bought your own or launched your own uh, used car lot. Then, uh, as time went by, uh, I eventually got started uh, in my own business when in my low thirties. And whereabouts was that? In Burnaby, Vancouver. No, it can be an eighteenth of Vancouver if you know where that is. I certainly do. And then. Uh, I understand that the first venture into another business was uh, you just wanted to make use of the property and put up a, a billboard. Is that correct? Well, that's right. Uh, we got into the billboard business. I got, I bought a, uh, into a public company called Neon Products and they had uh, some oddball billboards. And so I, I was very sold on billboards because in the car business, we advertise a lot. In the, at least I did in used cars, new cars, and so billboards came along. So I got into billboards, and so that was the second business. And then I understand the third business was uh, grocery. Is that correct? No, well, the third business was radio. Radio, probably because yeah. of the advertising. Because it, it, because of advertising, today we got forty-eight radio stations in Western Canada. Um, I had the privilege of uh, working on due diligence uh, for one of the uh, acquisitions of radio. He did Monarch Broadcasting. Right. I remember that. And, uh, and that's uh, primarily Alberta? Alberta, yes. Primarily Alberta. And, and these radio stations are talk radio and, uh, and Christian rock and, uh, and, and what other genres? You had at one point in time an oldie, an oldie station in Vancouver. They, there's all, they're all different. Uh, country and Western is very popular in uh, many of our stations today, but they're very, depending on the market. Now, why would you be in small town TV, radio, and billboards in this era of internet and, uh, and social media and streaming online services, et cetera? Well, we went into the radio business a long time ago, and we're still in it. And so you think there's still a business, obviously, for radio? Oh, sure. We, we would buy. In fact, we just made an offer recently on some radio stations. And, uh, but uh, we'll see what happens. Well, given that you're talking to me on a radio show right now, I appreciate your positive uh, thoughts about that. It is interesting, though, Jimmy. I get as much listenership on podcasts and the social media posts of the videos as I do at the six o'clock uh, drive home time that uh, our radio show was on. So, you know, the radio show is, is the base, but we get tons of viewership and listenership through the podcasts and the video casts. Absolutely. And we see the same thing out here. Podcasts are very popular. And so then how did you get into the grocery? Because that's one of your biggest businesses in, uh, in both Alberta and British Columbia, is it not? Well, we got into groceries and I, I got a phone call. I was, I was in my car dealership in my office one day and the phone rang and this fellow says, Jimmy, you should buy a company called Overweighty. 
And I said, well, I'll look into it. And so I looked into it and I did buy it. The company was called Overweighty. And that because, was... In other words, if you bought uh, anything that was 16 ounces, you'd get 18 ounces for the price of 16. So they always gave you more than you paid for it. And the company was called Overweighty. And that was the, the 1970s? That would have been in the... In the uh, early 60s, early it was 60s. In the late 60s, rather. late 60s. And you've grown it fairly dramatically. You've bought uh, um, other grocery uh, uh, store chains in, in Vancouver and in, in British Columbia and Alberta um, and elsewhere. Is that not correct? That is correct. We have over 300 stores now. Over 300. And uh, I had a wonderful time doing another due diligence trip. We went up to uh, Anchorage and looked at some stores in Alaska. Did you buy in Alaska? Yes, we did. We've gone into Alaska today. We've spent a lot of money in Alaska the last couple of years in the fishing business. But not in grocery? Not in grocery. So the fishing business is uh, the Canadian fishing company, Canfisco. Um, and, uh, and, and you are one of the largest canners of, uh, of fish products on, on the West Coast. How and why did you get into canning of fish? Well, because... The company, it was an American company actually, and uh, they de decide <clears throat> they decided to put, <clears throat> excuse me, they decided to put the Canadian company they had up for auction. And I went to Seattle and went to an auction and bought the company at the auction. And that was the Canadian fishing company owned by the Americans on the East Coast. Actually sold in an auction. Sold in an auction in a courtroom in Seattle. And how many bidders were there? Uh, there was about eight or nine. That must have been a fun, uh, a fun day. Well, I, I drove down by myself and came back by myself. And uh, I didn't know what we bought. I'd never been in the building. I just, my, my right-hand man had looked at it and said, Jimmy, we should buy this company. And so that's what happened. I was do, actually, Expo 86 uh, World's Fair in Vancouver was on at the time and I was running that. So I just drove down one day, went to the auction and came back. Fantastic. And, uh, and now you've got canneries up the West coast of uh, British Columbia, as well as Alaska and some in uh, Bristol Bay, which is that uh, bay that's, Right at almost at Russia. Well, right, it, uh, Bristol Bay is a very big, uh, I believe 50% of all the sockeye salmon in the world is caught in Bristol Bay. I understand. My uh, funnest story during that trip, uh, um, you may remember it, is that uh, we went to Naknek and Igagik, um, and we were in uh, little tiny planes and we landed on the main drag of the, of the, of the towns because the main drag of the town. Um, also uh, duplicated as uh, the runway for the, the, the air service. And, uh, and we had to buzz the town to make sure no cars were on the, the road to start with. And then we turned around and landed on the, uh, on the, on the street that was the runway. Yeah, <clears throat> that's correct. The other thing that was interesting is um, they had this uh, thing they called rock and roll uh, mosh pits um, where they were um, um, catching the salmon. And what it was, is, I guess, the salmon want to spawn back where they were born. And a lot of the salmon were put back into the rivers and the streams um, through dropping the eggs uh, off of a boat in the middle of a, of a river. Um, and those salmon then came back and wanted to find that, that place back again. And they were all jumping up and down uh, like a mosh pit in a rock and roll concert, trying to find their way home. No, that's exactly right. And the same thing applies to the... Fraser River here in British Columbia. Well, it's a great business. I've uh, I've, I've always enjoyed your uh, your smoked salmon. I used to uh, used to get it uh, on a very frequent basis. We're chatting tonight with Jim Pattison, Jimmy Pattison, a renowned Canadian entrepreneur. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Jimmy in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's an incredible honor of mine tonight to be uh, chatting with uh, Jimmy Pattison, a renowned uh, Canadian entrepreneur, runs uh, the Jim Pattison Group out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, 
And just uh, so everyone knows my bias, I had the pleasure of working for Jimmy for uh, several years in the late 1990s and 2000. It was uh, one of the most enjoyable times of my life. He was uh, just an incredibly interesting gentleman to work uh, with and for. Um, I had some wonderful times on your boat, sir, um, where uh, you would take us out uh, around Vancouver Harbor and up uh, the side of the coast. Uh, we had some great times at Frank Sinatra's house in uh, Palm Springs. Um, Partners in Pride uh, conferences that you brought your management to were excellent. And uh, you were one of the hardest driving, smartest, uh, best bosses I've ever had the pleasure of working for. So thank you so much for, for the privilege of uh, those, uh, those several years. You found incredibly good people over the years. Uh, you know, some of the gentlemen um, that I've worked with uh, when I was with you and that I've interacted with uh, since then have been some of the most impressive business people that I've, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with. Your, your, your executive assistant, uh, Maureen, has been with you for, for something like 50 years or something like that. How do you attract and keep? What's, what's your secret to success uh, on attracting and keeping great people? Well, first of all, I'll go back to Marie. She's been with me 60 years. <laughs> and, uh, and we started basically when uh, we started when we had a three pump gas station and a two car showroom. And she's been with me all these years. Uh, well, the most important thing in anything is, is people. And, uh, and of course, uh, there are people who have. Uh, there are people that are good at some things. It's like musicians. You get a really, really good violin player, but they may not be any good at arithmetic. The key is getting people that are good at what they do in the job that is fitted for them. There's a lot of people that, that uh, would be, I know I got a job, a summer job one time uh, in the Okanagan, and it was broadening a, a creek with a shovel. And, uh, and I wasn't any good at it at all. And because I just wasn't cut out for shoveling a mud in an in a, in a Okanagan River uh, in British Columbia. And uh, so it, the key is getting the right person fitted for the right opportunity. And that all gets back to judgment. And how do you um, how do you exercise that judgment? Any secrets in how you exercised it? Well, no, but I mean you 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 have to make the call on the person. And the other thing, of course, is when you do make a mistake, don't live with it, and uh, until you get it right. So you uh, once told me that you always wanted to have dinner with someone um, so that you would understand whether they were nice socially um, and whether you could actually have a conversation with them. Do you still do that? Well, we still have lots of dinners with people in our business and, uh, and lunches. We, we, we do it. That's we do all the time. And you often wanted to meet the, the individual spouse. Why? I'm sorry. I didn't understand, Brian. You, you told me you often wanted to have dinner with or meet the, uh, the person's spouse, their partner, uh, because you thought that was an important uh, assessment of what they were really well, like. We, we always, historically, if you hire somebody that's important, we like to see the family side of it, if they're married, and uh, see how that all is. Because somebody that's got a domestic problem usually isn't very, haven't got their mind on the job that needs to get done. You told me once that it was your uh, um, airport uh, lounge uh, analysis about whether someone was interesting enough if you got stuck in an airport that you'd have uh, an interesting conversation with them, which I found kind of fascinating. But you have been renowned as being tough as well. And uh, at one point in time, uh, someone wrote that you uh, wanted to, to get rid of the, 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 the bottom person out of 10 uh, uh, in sales every year. Was that true? No. It's not true. I wanted, I did it ever. I uh, looked at firing the bottom person every month. Every month? Every month. We, uh, we had uh, 35 used car salesmen. And uh, I always looked at firing somebody who, who was the worst every month, uh, generally speaking. Now, there's exceptions to every rule. 
the best salesman I ever had didn't sell anything for three months. And, uh, and uh, I made exceptions because he was working hard and trying hard. And uh, eventually became the top salesman we ever had. You explained it to me well once, um, because I think a lot of people are very resistant to uh, uh, firing someone, terminating someone. And you said, look, they're not going to be successful here. They're not going to work out. And so really what I want to do is I want them to to find their better opportunity. Well, it's good for them, because if uh, if I hire somebody that, that likes making shoes and I put them on a used car lot uh, and it's not he's not suited for it it's better that he move on rather than keep trying to do something that he's not fit to do. I've had more people stop me on the streets in Vancouver and thank me for firing them years ago because they got, they were in the wrong industry and they got into something they liked and were good at and became successful. I think a lot of people um, don't follow that uh, philosophy and they keep, uh, uh, people around too long and uh, and 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 people stagnate and uh, and aren't successful and so I think that your attitude uh, and strategy in that regard actually uh, even though it may sound harsh uh, initially is the right one uh, and you do it's give people better it's, opportunities it's the right for person too because if you're not fit out to be a, a used car salesman which was the business I have been in all these years um, and he's better off selling shoes uh, he might have an a, a interest in that that he had, doesn't have in cars, or he, or it could be something else, a conductor on the railway or something. The key is getting people fit into the right job that suits them. And Every year, you would have these big uh, Partners in Pride uh, management conferences, and, uh, and they really were an opportunity for people to get together, learn from uh, other uh, um, companies, divisions in the company to get uh, enthused by meeting, uh, um, you know, your speakers that you would bring in to go to seminars. Um, do you think those uh, those annual management meetings that you must have invested a fair amount of money in, were they beneficial? Well, we, <clears throat> we, we've had them now going on 60 years and uh, we got one coming up here in the next couple months because of the cost. Because of the virus, we haven't had one for two years, but uh, we, we've got people coming from uh, Europe, China, the US, and we still have that meeting you're talking about every year, but except the last two, and uh, we're starting back at it in a few weeks. You would often bring in uh, famous politicians um, to yeah. speak. Uh, why would you do that? Well, because how often would you get a chance to meet with the president of the United States or, or past president of the United States or Margaret Thatcher, the past prime minister of Great Britain, people that have been hugely successful in their, in their, in uh, what they chose to do for a living. And uh, it gives them a different slant on things. And, uh, and so we've always tried to bring in special people that, uh, that our folks can relate to. You told me a great story once about Bob Hope coming to, I think it was Penticton, BC or Kelowna, BC, I can't remember, uh, and, uh, and performing at one of your uh, conferences. Absolutely, we brought Bob Hope in and uh, uh, he was, uh, but what impressed me about Bob Hope he flew in in a private airplane to Penticton, British Columbia, and he was to perform the next day. And he went immediately and started to practice for his presentation that was coming the next day. And I never forgot it, that somebody like Bob Pope that was famous all over the United States and the world. But when he came to a little town in British Columbia and, and he got the first thing he said when he got up on the stage that day was he said to everybody, I've had more people for at, at my house for dinner than are here tonight. And that's how he started the deal. 
I never forgot it. Well, you told me once that uh, um, after you asked him why he was practicing so hard, uh, all of his uh, lines and jokes and, uh, and other things that he had said, whether it's uh, Bob Hope in front of 50,000 people at Madison Square Gardens or Bob Hope for 100 people in Penticton, B.C., it's going to be the best Bob Hope Bob Hope could possibly be. That, absolutely. And that's obviously one of the reasons he was so successful. Practice, practice, practice. I learned a good lesson from him. I still got his picture on my wall. You also um, <clears throat> were unbelievably rigorous in your financial analysis. I remember, um, you know, every Monday afternoon sitting down and going through cash flows for every single division, every single business that you had. I remember uh, presenting to you and you, you know, going through the financial numbers in incredible detail. Do you think that that's critical to your success? Well, <clears throat> it's the reason we have done, we did it, started to do it was because we were always so tight with the banks that. We, we didn't have much flexibility and the banks were really our boss because we could only grow as they'd loan us the money. And uh, so we had to be sure that, that we could meet our obligations. But you know, today we still have that meeting at nine o'clock every Saturday morning. Nine o'clock every Saturday morning. And, and my memory is that the, the presidents or uh, VP finances or controllers of each one of the different businesses no. had to be by the telephone with the right answers in case uh, Jimmy phoned. No, well, we have it in person. Our top four executives here in the holding company review every, uh, every uh, sheet that comes in Friday night Fantastic. of every division. And uh, in acquisitions, you were also uh, very uh, financially astute. Well, we, we haven't been, we bought a couple of companies recently, but we haven't been doing much buying with this, uh, the virus in the last couple of years. Why? Just because you can't get out to visit places? Or? Not, we haven't been traveling. People have been actually stay at home. We have, but out of it will come some opportunities. And we've bought a couple uh, companies in the last few months. And uh, so anyway, no, people are not traveling. People don't want it. Haven't been anxious to see anybody. Travel was uh, was critically important to you and and visiting people on their own turf. I remember uh, you um, we had a, we had a meeting scheduled with a bank and you uh, grabbed me and said, "No, we're going to go meet them in their office in their bank uh, because uh, people will will feel different when you come to see them." And uh, same thing when someone had an acquisition uh, opportunity, you wanted to go actually visit the office and visit the plant. Why was going to their turf so important to you? Well, I think that uh, we are anxious to see the people in their environment and, uh, and visit their facilities and in many cases meet their people. And you're, we're talking about acquisitions and things of that nature. You, the biggest mistake I've made is doing per due diligence on an acquisition. We're chatting today with Jim Patterson, Jimmy Patterson, uh, renowned Canadian entrepreneur um, in Vancouver, British Columbia. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back with Jimmy in two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Jimmy Patterson, uh, renowned Canadian uh, entrepreneur, a uh, businessman uh, runs the Jim Patterson Group out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Several billion dollars of uh, revenue and assets uh, and everything from uh, grocery stores to uh, plastic packaging. And, uh, and Jimmy, you know, it always amazed me. You own West Shore Terminals, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, coal terminals on the West Coast of uh, North America. I think you're now um, converting it over to uh, pot potash. Um, and, uh, and then you also own Ripley's, believe it or not, a chain of, uh, of museums and aquariums. How can one company own coal distribution terminals and fund museums? Easy. Uh, find the money, buy the asset, and they get somebody like Brian Crombie that knows what he's doing to run it. So you don't think you needed to know each one of the different businesses and have experience in the businesses, you can find good people to actually run well, them. 
the answer is we don't know. We can't begin to know the different industries that we're in. We learn more after we get into them, but the key is buying, is having people that, man, everything, it gets down to good management. And, uh, and that, the key, the job that we have, uh, one of the reasons that we've grown uh, to the degree we have is because we've been able to get good management to run the asset. And that's the key. I remember going on two trips with you, sir. One, um, I, I remember going on lots of trips, but two uh, uh, on a specific topic. We went into a grocery store, and I think it was uh, in Kelowna, I believe. And um, and walking into the the front, uh, you stooped down and picked up some garbage. You didn't stop and say anything about it. You just picked it up. Everyone noticed. And then uh, when we were walking by a garbage can, you threw it out. And then we were in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and uh, walking through. Uh, I don't think it was an aquarium. I think it was a uh, a wax museum, and you did the same thing. And uh, I asked you about it at one point in time, and you said, it's just an example that I want to provide to people of the, the very detailed, uh, take charge of all the details management. And if, uh, and if I'm willing to do it, then every president, every general manager should be willing to do it. Well, I don't remember that part of it, but, but if uh, I go into a store, uh, and same thing applied in Expo 86, when I was running X-86 in Vancouver, a World's Fair, when I was out on uh, walking around, if there was paper that was laying around, I'd pick it up and put it in the closest garbage can. But you weren't doing it because you were going to be the janitorial service. You were doing it as an example to the rest of your management, were you not? Well, apart from that, we're anxious, uh, apart from setting an example, we did, uh, don't want a bunch of a junk on the place where people walk. And uh, it's a good example to set for the employees, but it's also the right thing to do. One of the most enjoyable times I've had um, from a work standpoint was being invited out on your boat. And, uh, and, and you did several things, but two things uh, that I'd like to mention on your boat when you would take people out. Number one, you would often end the night uh, playing your organ. Uh, for everyone, and everyone would gather around, have a lot of fun uh, um, singing songs and listening to you play the organ. And the other thing you did on several occasions is you would um, ask everyone to speak for two minutes. And, uh, and then you'd go around the room and everyone would have two minutes to, uh, to speak. Why would you do that? Well, first of all, it helps everybody know each other if they're strangers, and it gives everybody a chance to say, Here's who I am. Here's what I do, and uh, give them a chance to say their piece. You know, it's interesting, Jimmy. It's a practice that I've tried to continue. Um, and if I have large dinner parties at my house, I'll tell you tell the story that Jim Patterson used to do this. That was my way of justifying that everyone would do it. Uh, but it was also that, uh, and I think you told me this before. If people get two minutes of undivided attention. In normal conversation, you never get that two minutes. People will interrupt you or speak over you or change the conversation or something like that. And even in two minutes, it's amazing the, uh, the content, particularly when you have a chance to think about it, that you can actually provide to people and, and, and convey a depth of knowledge and passion for something. And, and I really, I treasured that experience with you and, I, and I've used it in my life ever since. Well, good. I found that people like, the opportunity and besides it helps people that are strangers know what somebody else does and uh, makes it more interesting for the person. How do you make decisions? You told me once that you you always sleep on a decision and think about whether you came to the right decision the next day again. Well I don't always make the right decision but certainly uh, it, it, it pays to consider carefully depending on the importance. Uh, people that make snap decisions without doing their homework eventually get in trouble. And I've, I've done that in my time too. I asked you once about your board of directors because you have a very, um, you know, an excellent board of directors and you're a private company, so you don't need to have a board of directors. And I, and I expressed the opinion that some people want board of directors that will be yes men, that will do whatever you really want. And, and, and why did you have such capable board members. And you said, why would I want to pay people money if they're not going to give me their best thinking? Well, <clears throat> there's board of directors are very important because 
you need somebody that that can have a different opinion, may have more experience than you have, and uh, and if you get high quality people that have proven good judgment and experience, it's a good thing to call, be able to call on people like that. And we value our directors very highly. You've had some management that have stayed with you for like 20, 30 years. And, and you mentioned Maureen for 60. How do yeah, you people interested for 20 or 30 years? Like Nick Demeray has been there for probably 30 years. Yeah, and he's still here. And uh, we, we don't have a lot of turnover in our management and uh, and that and, that, and we like that uh, because they don't they've got experience they've seen our mistakes and understand what we're all about and what our our basic values are you have a reasonably what I would have thought of as a flat organization not a lot of hierarchy I, uh, I you know I'm not sure what it is today but when I worked with you there were six managing directors that reported to you. Um, and then, uh, and then you had, uh, you know, all the divisional presidents or company presidents that reported in. Um, do you believe in a in a in a flat hierarchy, or 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 what's your attitude toward management structure? Well, I think that that you, in my opinion, you want as few people between you and your customers that you can have. And I'm not big on a bunch of people with fancy titles. The key is the customer and to be sure that we know what, where to invest our money and, uh, and all the things that you get that you, your customer is your best source of information. But you would have had, you know, I think six or seven people report to you, uh, as well as probably, I don't know, 30 different uh, presidents report to you. Um, can, can one person manage six direct reports? Most people would have had like only three or four direct reports. No, we have, today we have it split up uh, as the company's grown, we, we have it split up in a two or three places now. So what, what's your structure now, sir? Well, our structure is that we have a president company, we have a couple of senior exec, executive vice presidents, and, uh, and we have uh, certain people report to different people at the top. But my, in my experience, at least, you've got a flatter organization uh, than most companies have. And, and, uh, and I, I like your attitude about as few people as possible between you and, uh, and the customer. Um, Vancouver is, uh, is your home today and has been for a long time. I, I think you're originally from Saskatchewan. Um, and, uh, and Vancouver and the West Coast uh, are critically important to you. Uh, you've got a, a room, at least you had a room, uh, a dining room in, in Palm Springs that uh, was decorated with a, a bunch of Aboriginal art. Um, you love taking the boat out on the West Coast. Uh, and you told me once that uh, it was important for your executives to live and work in Vancouver. Why is Vancouver and the West Coast so important for you? Well, it's a good uh, place to live. Uh, if you're going to live uh, in a free enterprise economy like we have. And uh, the climate out here is very good. We're close to the US, we're Vancouver, and uh, the United States is a very important country to Canada. And certainly in our case, where we're doing more and more business in the States. And so, and it's a good location. We have operations in both China and Japan. And uh, and South Korea, we go there. And so it's a good, good location for what we do today. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's, it's, I, I think you're really connected with uh, the, the indigenous, the Aboriginal roots of the West Coast, are you not? Well, no, we, we certainly, uh, on, from time to time, deal with, with them. But no, it, it's basically, today, more and more of our business is in the US. You bought uh, Frank Sinatra's house in Palm Springs, did you not? I did. Uh, bought it from Frank Sinatra years ago. You st it was still alive. You still own it? Still own it. Still use it. And uh, when I was there, uh, you had his train set set up and you had um, uh, movies in his theater room. Does that still happen? Still do. Still got the same 
train set, the same theater. And we, as a matter of fact, we haven't changed the doorknob on the, in the house like Frank. If something breaks, we try to do it exactly like Frank had it. It's just amazing some of the things that you've bought. Um, what attracted you to Ripley's Believe It or Not? Was uh, I, I was running Expo 86, and that's in 1986. I was in there uh, on a, in an afternoon that was a holiday, and I was at my desk, and I got a strange phone call, and a fellow says, are you Jim Patterson? And I said, yes. He said, he said, you should buy Ripley's Believe It or Not. It's the worst run company I've ever dealt with. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you do with them? He said, I'm a franchisee and you should go look at it and hung up. And so I looked at it with my right hand man who did, the, did all the work looking into it. Uh, Bill Sleeman, his name was, and we bought the company and that was over 30 years ago. And uh, they have uh, aquariums that are probably what they're most known for now, but they also have wax museums, uh, Guinness Book of World Records, uh, Motion Master no, Theater. Ripley doesn't have Guinness World Records. That, that's totally separate. Guinness World Records comes out of, out of it initially came out of Ireland, but it's it headquartered now in London, England. Okay, sorry. But wax museums, correct? Louis Tussauds? Uh, the museums are the Ripley's. Guinness World Records is publishing, and also when they have, uh, they'll have events to uh, select people and so on. Fantastic. We're chatting tonight with Jim Pattison of the Jim Pattison Group. We're going to take uh, a final break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. We'll be back in two minutes. Welcome back. One of my most favorite gentlemen in the whole wide world is with us tonight, Jim Pattison of the Jim Pattison Group. He's uh, worth a couple billion dollars. He's built a successful enterprise, but more importantly, he is one of the smartest, nicest uh, people you could ever want to meet. Jimmy, your religion is, uh, is very important to you. Why? Well, I'm not, not very big on religion, uh, but I am uh, very... Uh, believe in my faith. Uh, and the faith is the Christian faith. I was, uh, my dad wasn't initially, or my mother, but they got involved in the uh, uh, Pentecostal evangelical type church in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. My dad was down and out, no job and no money. And it was through the Evangelical Pentecostal Church in Saskatoon, 19th and Avenue G, that uh, got my dad's life straightened out. And he came over to Vancouver and started over his life again with my mother and I. And, uh, and my dad worked in a downtown Skid Road mission on Hastings Street in Vancouver. And I worked with him till I was 26 years old and was married and had two children and worked with my mother and dad uh, all those years in Vancouver on Skid Row. And you used to go to church every Sunday. Do you still? Absolutely. I do. Well, not. I haven't during the virus, uh, but uh, normally I actually, my wife is not well. So I've been going Saturday nights. They have service Saturday night. So I've been going Saturday night and then, then I go, then Sunday morning, I'm with her and we turn on the TV and watch two or three Christian programs. And philanthropy, uh, giving to charity is important to you. You gave money, I know, to, I think it was prostate cancer in Vancouver. Uh, why is giving money um, important to you? Well, we're very happy that we're able to do so. We have supported primarily uh, hospitals. We've taken our our uh, sort of focus, our main focus is giving to hospitals that, that need our help. And so we have put uh, a fair amount of money into hospitals and we continue to do that. 
you um, often will meet politicians and uh, they'll come to visit you. And, and, and I don't know if you've actually actively supported uh, them publicly, but you've uh, wanted to meet them, get to know what they're about and, uh, and make some comments on policies. Why are you involved in and interested in the political process? Well, I, I'm because I, I think uh, all of us are interested in, in who runs the country and who runs the province who runs the city or town you live in. And so uh, in our case, we have, because of the number of employees, which we have, which is over 50,000 employees today, we're very anxious on, and uh, supporting people that we think that can uh, do a good job of running our country, province, and city. Well, I think that uh, you do a great job in that regard. And so uh, please keep it up. sir. A lot of people in Canada, probably around the world, but in Canada, um, are are going through a tough time right now. They, you know, we've gone through two years of a pandemic. Um, we're, you know, watching every day about uh, invasions of Ukraine and Russia. Inflation is up. Interest rates look like they're going up. Uh, people are are um, are worried about their future. Um, you've got twenty to thirty thousand people listening to you right now. Do you have a message? for the people listening to you right now about, about the future, about how they should feel and what they should be doing? Well, I can't speak for anybody what they should be doing. All I, I'm optimistic about the future. I think we're going to have a, a, a very different time for a while uh, adjusting. I think that some of these things that we ha we've gone through with the pandemic are going to take a while for us to work through, but, uh, be honest, hard work, living in a democracy like we do and in Canada, the United States, we're certainly fortunate and I'm very grateful to be alive on a Canadian. Jim Patterson, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. I really appreciate your time, sir. I really appreciate the time that uh, I worked with you. I got to tell uh, everyone that uh, while I was working after uh, the first uh, divisional meetings every quarter, uh, we would go on uh, on Jimmy's jet uh, around uh, the country, around North America, actually, not just the country, and, and visit uh, each one of the different operating businesses for better part of more than a week, a, a week and a, and a day or two. Um, and uh, the number of people we would meet, the number of businesses we would see, the number of meetings that we'd be in, uh, and the number of times that Jimmy had incredibly imp you know, impactful things to say. I started keeping at the back of my uh, my book uh, a list of Jimmyisms, and uh, and I got to tell you, Jimmy, that uh, I I look at that list and I use them um, quite frequently. I quote you. Uh, um, I hope you don't mind uh, fairly often. Uh, and I think one of the things that I liked about you uh, and respected about you the most was we'd have those meetings and you would go last, uh, and you'd ask all of the managing directors uh, to uh, to make their um, presentations or ask their questions first, and then you would uh, sum up at the end. And you always, you know, thought of something that none of the rest of us had thought about, and you had a critical concluding comment or strategic comment. And I asked you about that. Uh, and, and again, you said, you know, why would I have you guys along if you're not going to ask smart questions? And if I speak first, uh, um, you may not ask those uh, questions or feel comfortable asking those questions. And I want to benefit from hearing what you've got to say. So you were, you really were a great boss, uh, but you were a great leader um, because you really wanted people, people wanted to follow you. People wanted to, uh, to participate in management um, of the company with you. They were inspired by you. Uh, they were motivated by you. They wanted to work hard for you and, and do a good job for you because you just didn't tell us what to do all the time. You did when we needed to be told, but, but you wanted us to, uh, to think for ourselves and, uh, and come to our own conclusions. Um, and then debate amongst ourselves with you at the head of the table. So I want to thank you very much for everything you've done for me, for the Jim Pattison Group, and for the country of Canada, because I think you've been just an unbelievable business person and a nice guy too. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Lots of good su success to you. Thank you. Well, that's our show for tonight. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, even from Vancouver, British Columbia at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and video casts are available on my website, briancrombie.com. My videos are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. My podcasts are on Audible, Apple, Speakeasy, and SoundCloud. 
thank you very much for joining us. And uh, to everyone, have a great long weekend for those celebrating Passover. Happy Passover. Those celebrating Easter, happy Easter. Good night, everybody. And thank you, Jimmy. Thank you.